I'd like to add my welcome to uh, everyone else, for all of you who are here tonight, um, regular attenders, uh, family, and friends of those who are regularly at our services. Thank you for coming. It's great to celebrate Christmas with you. And uh, where else would you rather be on a Thursday night? It surely beats Thursday night football, right? I mean, uh, I'm sure that you would rather be here than that. Well, we want to think for a few moments about uh, why are we here? What is it really all about? There was a great story that came out of World War II about the pianist and author named uh, Oscar Levant. Some of you are probably familiar with him. He, was, uh, he volunteered for military service. And when he came into the enlistment office for an interview, they said to him, well, Mr. Levant, you're a rather refined man. Do you think that you can kill? Levant thought about that for a moment. Finally, he said, well, I don't know about strangers, but my friends, definitely. <laughs> so we live in a fragmented world, do we not? Sometimes it's those closest to us that the alienation seems to be the greatest. When we see events like those that are happening these days in Syria, in, in uh, Iraq, and even in San Bernardino, uh, we come to the conclusion that things are not exactly improving. Many of you will remember when Rodney King famously said, and I think it was around 1992, why can't we all just get along? Great question, right? And mankind has spent literally billions of dollars trying to answer that question without success. But God has always known the answer to that question. He's revealed it in his word. The problem is our hopelessly flawed human hearts Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick, terminally ill, literally. Who can know it? The problem is inside of all of us. That's why peace is so elusive. It's also one of the reasons that Christmas is ours, because God has always known why we can't get along, but God became in the person of Jesus Christ the solution to that problem. Among other things that Jesus came to earth to do was to bring peace. He is called in Isaiah 9, 6, where we have a number of titles for him, but one of those is the Prince of Peace. And it's not, beloved, just something that God threw out there because it sounded good. He had a reason for saying that. And I'd like for us just to think about a little bit for a few minutes tonight, how is it that this little baby born in squalor in this nowhere place in the world who really did nothing for the first 30 years of his life before his ministry took on an, an unbelievable unbelievably impressive significance. How is it, though, that that one can bring peace that no one else can bring? Three ways that I want us to think about briefly tonight. Number one, he enables peace with God. He enables peace with God. Why is that important? Because every one of us is born into this world at war with God. I know we don't like to think of it that way. We like to think God surely is on our side, and he is. The Bible says that he loves us, that when we were still sinners, that he loved us. But make no mistake, we violate his character on a daily basis, and we have from the moment that we were born. We owe God a perfection that we can never, ever pay. And so we are at enmity with God, not at peace. But this is why the message of Christmas is so unbelievably fantastic, because the message of Christmas is that what God demands, God supplies. And so Jesus came to live the perfect life that we could not live, so that he could pay the 
infinite penalty that we could not pay so that we could have acceptance with God that we could never earn. In the words of Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin for this very reason, that we could become the righteousness of God. Think about that. How do you become the righteousness of God? How do you become the perfection that only resides in God? And the answer is in the next three, verse, three words in that verse, through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. We trade our sin for his righteousness. I've said it many times to our congregation, it's the greatest trade in history, right? I give up the enmity. I sue for peace by bringing my sin and my sin only to the throne of God and saying, here it is. I, I want to accept the righteousness that you've offered. 1920, the Boston Red Sox traded a young pitcher to the New York Yankees for $100,000 in cash. A lot of people thought at the beginning that Boston got the best of that deal, but that $100,000 was soon gone, squandered by the owner of the Red Sox on a failed Broadway show. Meantime, Babe Ruth, the pitcher turned outfielder, dominated baseball for the next 15 years as no one else in history has ever done. What a great trade for the New York Yankees, right? But it doesn't hold a candle, beloved, to the trade that God offers us through Jesus, his righteousness for your sin. That's why he came, to bring peace with God, not as something that can be earned, but as something that can only be received by faith. Peace with God. Secondly, he came and he enables us to have peace with with self, peace with self. The author William Faulkner once said, the central human drama is the heart in conflict with itself. H.G. Wells said it even simpler. He said, human beings are a walking civil war. What he meant was that inside we are in turmoil, and it's true. But why? Why is it that we have this turmoil inside? And once again, the Bible answers the question that mankind doesn't have the answer to. The Bible says it's because we have turmoil inside because we can't live up to what we know we ought to be. We know our, our sense of oughtness dominates us, but, but we can't get from here to there. The Bible says we have that sense of oughtness, which... By the way, naturalism has no explanation for what the Bible does. It says in Romans 2.15, we have that because God has put his law in our hearts. He's put a, a bit of himself in our hearts. He's, he's written his character, in a sense, into our hearts as something that we owe him. And yet we can never measure up. We can't live up to what we know to be right. And so what happens? Guilt, right? <laughs> Guilt dominates. And I know we live in a society that denies guilt, but if you think it is being successfully denied, let me, let me give you just one statistic. Guilt is a $50 billion business in the United States alone. That's how much we spend every year on psychologists and psychiatrists, most of whom, by the way, are trying to tell us when it comes to guilt, yeah, I know you feel guilty, but just deny it, change your thinking pattern, and you can get over it. It's the worldly way. Deny it. But it does not work. We continue to have the turmoil inside. We continue to be at war with ourselves. Because the Prince of Peace, you see, knows that the guilt is real. We do violate God's character on a daily basis. Frankly, in our minds and in our thoughts and in some of our attitudes and ambitions, we violate the character of God on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. The solution is not to deny it. 
The solution in the Bible is very simple. It's to repent, something that we find very hard to do. The solution to the guilt problem is to repent. Peace comes not from, not from repression, but from confession. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the promise of God to us based on the fact that his son died for our sins. He tells us that those who have been justified by faith have then peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us that the peace of God passes all understanding and it keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He's the center of it all. He's the only one who can, listen, he's the only one who can forgive the fact that you are not what you ought to be because he has been for you what you ought to be. That's what forgiveness is. That's what the gospel is. This baby came specifically to pay the penalty for sin, which is why he can say in John 14, I have said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. That's where it comes from. It comes from him. As one songwriter said, put it this way, he said, well, may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. Jehovah knoweth none. That's the promise of God in the person of Jesus Christ. He enables peace with self. Thirdly, and finally, he enables peace with others. Why do we have conflict? Why is it so difficult to get along uh, with other people, sometimes even those closest to it, to us? The Bible answers that question. It tells us the reason that we have difficulty getting along. Well, there are many peripheral issues. The basic root issue is that we all have rights that we think are being violated and we will defend our rights to the death. Doesn't matter whether it's the right of possession, we think someone's taking from us, the right of expertise, I know more than the other person, the right of prestige, I'm more important than they are, or just the right to be right. I mean, the list goes on and on. We defend our rights. Paul advised there's a better way. He said this in Philippians 2. He said, have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, meaning he was God, did not count equality with God a thing that he had to hang on to, but he emptied himself of his right as God by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What's Paul saying? Paul is saying basically this. Where would you be if Jesus had demanded his rights? We'd be nowhere. And so the instruction for those who claim to be followers of Jesus is follow in his wake in this way as well. Let your rights be in his hands, not in your hands. That's why Jesus can say in a passage like Matthew 5.44, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you be sons of the Father who is in heaven. In other words, don't worry about your rights. Say, how can you, how can you possibly do that? Again, the Bible answers, you do that because you trust God to take care of your rights. He says in Romans 12, 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. He's a lot better at it than you are. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Jesus enables peace with others. A few years ago, some of you who've lived long enough will remember this. They used to play the records backwards. Do you remember that? You know, they would claim that the Beatles, when they put out a record, you just play it backwards, and there's a secret message in there. And they started to do that with all these songs. And so somebody, some wise guy said, well, I'll tell you, what do you get when you play country music backwards? His answer was, well, you get your wife back, you get your pickup back, you get your dog back, 
your mama gets out of jail, well, you get the picture, right? <laughs> you can reverse the curse. That's why Jesus came, beloved. He came to eliminate the alienation that entered the world the moment man decided to pit his will against God's. He's the only one who can do it, but boy, can he do it. Let me just give you one example. You say, you know, bring it down to earth. Is this really practical? Absolutely. 1968, young man named Billy Moore, living in Georgia. Poor young man, really didn't see any future himself for himself, and so he took it upon himself, having heard about someone who lived in the neighborhood where he was that, that, that hid cash away in his home. He entered the home to get the cash. The homeowner woke up, somehow got his hands on a shotgun, fired a shotgun blast at Billy Moore and missed him, and Billy Moore shot him and killed him. A few days later, they found him, and they found the cash, I think it was $5,000, that he had stolen from that house. And so they had him dead to rights. He confessed the sin, confessed that he was the one who had killed this man, and he was given the death sentence. His mother, thank God for mothers, right? His mother talked to some of the leaders in her church and said, would you go talk to my son? So they did. They came and they told him about the gospel that we've been talking about tonight. They told him about the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. They told him about the one who came and loved him so much that he died for him. And here's what Billy Moore said. He said, he said the message that Jesus loves me and died for me, I never heard. He said it was a love that I wanted. It was a love that I needed. It was the love that changed my life. Now, you and I have all lived long enough to know that there's a lot of death bay, or a jailhouse uh, confessions, conversions that are not real. This was not one of those. The trustees in that prison, after a few weeks, they saw the change that was taking place in Billy Moore, and they actually, when he asked for it, they brought a little, some kind of a little uh, tub in so he could be baptized, because he'd been reading the Bible and found out if I'm a Christian, I should be baptized, and he was baptized there in the prison. He began to conduct Bible studies, he began to take Bible study correspondence courses so that he was learning what the Word of God was saying. People began to come, and come to faith in Christ because of his witness. Eventually, his cell block became known as, he became known as the peacemaker because there were so many people there that had come to faith in Christ that it was the most peaceful place in the prison. Legally, there was no help. He had pleaded guilty. The courts, over the years, 16 years that he was in there, time after time, reaffirmed the death sentence. But his, but his Transformation was so profound that word began to leak out. And pretty famous people began to find out about this, including Mother Teresa and others. And they began to petition the state on behalf of him. Not because he asked them to, but just because they had heard what he was doing. Literally hours before he was supposed to go to the electric chair in 1991. The Georgia parole office voted unanimously to commute his death sentence. Then they did something completely unprecedented. They let him out of jail. Nobody ever heard of anything like that. But so complete was the transformation, so complete was the change in his life that they let him out of jail. And today, Billy Moore is a pastor of a church down in the center of Georgia, biracial church spreading the same gospel that saved his life. Somebody asked him one time, well, what was it? Was it, was it some reha re rehabilitation system that got you through this? He said, no. Self-help system? He said, no. Some kind of counseling? He said, no. What was it? He said, plain and simple, it was Jesus Christ. It was the baby in the manger, beloved changing somebody in the 20th century into the 21st century, bringing peace where there was no peace.
peace. He said, he changed me in ways I could never have changed on my own. He gave me a heart for others. He saved my soul. Listen, Jesus didn't come to give a bunch of pleasant platitudes to get people to think differently. He didn't come to establish a nice holiday that we could all celebrate his birthday and get our families together and have good times. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to change your life. That's why he came. I'll tell you something else. He would have come if you were the only person in the whole world. Josh McDowell says, that's when I came to faith in Christ, when I realized he would have come, died, and been resurrected again for me alone, if that's what it took. That's why Christmas. But if it's going to do you any good, if he's going to change your life, you've got to get him out of the manger, beloved, and into your heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder of why you've come, the Prince of Peace. You bring peace where peace is not possible any other way. And one day, the whole world will experience peace, those who are believers anyway, because you will separate all those who will not believe in you from all those who do. And the Bible is very clear that you will become the ruler of this world and the ruler of heaven. All the authority that the Father has given you, you will now exercise in a kingdom of absolute peace and joy, with no suffering, no pain, no anything that's not right. You will have reversed the curse completely, but you would do it in our hearts right now tonight if we would just let you. Father, if there's anyone here who's not done that, would you help them to do it right now in the quietness of this hour? And then as we come to your table, they will be equipped, even as a new believer, to celebrate with us what Jesus has done for us. So how can we do anything except give you thanks that we can belong to you? We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.